Hey, I want to welcome our Beaver Dam family to our experience of worship this morning. I'm glad that you're you're tuning in. I've always said the worship is very, very important, even though we can't gather like we normally do. Um, I'm glad you're um, you're worshiping in this fashion, is that we can still stay connected. Uh, but I need to tell you, this is the last time uh, that we are going to be worshiping like this through, through our our uh, canned music and uh, canned sermon, um, pre-recorded sermon, uh, because next week we're going to change things up a little bit. We uh, are going to live stream uh, our service from the sanctuary uh, at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. So uh, every every uh, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. So uh, we'll direct you to, you know, you can come to the webpage again and we'll direct you to the live stream so you'll be watching it as it happens. Uh, so along those same lines, uh, our church is going to be open next Sunday. And so we invite you if you feel comfortable and you want to come out and, and uh, worship, not expecting, you, you know, uh, a, a large crowd by any stretch of the imagination uh, because there will be certain protocols. You know, you'll have to wear masks. Uh, every other pew will be uh, cordoned off, and, and so you will still maintain social distancing inside. You'll come in through the side doors of the church and exit through the uh, the back of the sanctuary. And so, but we're going to be open uh, next week uh, at 10 a.m. And then you can catch the service live uh, on the internet on our webpage. Uh, at 10 a.m. as well. Another thing that we're adding is that that same 10 o'clock service will also be broadcast on the radio. So you can, you know, you know, if 830 has been too early for you and you want to come at 10 o'clock, you can find a space out in the parking lot, tune in to 93.5 and catch it. Uh, the service inside the church on the radio while in the safety of your car. So we're going to add that as well. Um, however, we are not doing away with the 8.30 drive-in service. That we're, we're still going to have. And so if you've been to that, uh, that's, been, uh, uh, that's been very enjoyable. I will still be outside preaching on top of the picnic table. And uh, so get to wave everybody through the windshields and stuff. So that's, uh, um, that, that is still going to be an option. So, you know, lots of stuff happening. And you can... Um, we have the instructions uh, on our webpage this week. It was on our e-news last week. If you if you haven't uh, subscribed to our email newsletter, <clears throat> hey, uh, just make sure you contact us. Uh, send it to the to the church email. Just say, hey, I want to get I want to get your e-news. That way, we have all the instructions of how we're going to handle worship and uh, all that's going on with Beaver Dam. Um, hey, I want to remind you that uh, to send in, if you were a part of Vacation Bible School this year, send in your uh, VBS offerings uh, because we're going we're gonna to put those together and, and all that money is going to go directly to Flavana County Meals on Wheels. And so you can just, you, know, you don't have to bring the train in. You can just write a check uh, and send, send it to us or drop it off uh, to us and just mark it. Uh, Meals on Wheels or Vacation Bible School. We'll make sure that full amount gets to them. Uh, so, uh, also, um, August 28th and 29th, we're having the uh, Meals Packaging event through Rise Against Hunger. And the sign-ups for that are now uh, on on our webpage. Where we have, I, I think there's a, there's a sign-up to it uh, on this link of how you're watching this as well, where you found this. And so uh, uh, go ahead, you can sign up. We need a couple people for Friday night and Saturday night, a couple people for, um, to help put things together on uh, Friday evening and then tear apart on uh, late Saturday morning. Uh, did I say? Yeah, Friday evening, Saturday morning is when we're doing it. And so um, we just need some people to help out. You can sign up that way. And we're partnering with uh, uh, Bybee Road. Baptist Church and Bird Chapel uh, are going to be joining us here in our um, our fellowship hall. Uh, finally, um, I want to say again, thank you for your giving to the ministries here at Beaver Dam. Y you know, we're able to do that meal packaging event uh, to 
to chip in our part of it. Uh, it was two thousand dollars, and you know we've had that money uh, in, in part of our ministry. We've already had it. We didn't have to go out and, and ask people for it. We figured that was kind of awkward during this time, but uh, that's because your your faithfulness in the past, and we were able to just uh, to uh, write a check for that for our portion of that. Um, you know, we this week we're going to unveil uh, a brand new uh, website, and uh, w which is important for us in these changing times, and do the live stream and all that. And we were able to to upgrade our web page because of your faithfulness in giving and purchasing the camera. I mentioned that before, and, and so, gosh, it is you, you know. Um, you all have been very, very faithful in your giving. So I just want to, I just want to say thank you to that and praise God for that. Uh, if there's anything that we as a church can help you out in anything, you know, we live in a very prideful times. We, we don't like to ask for help or we figure, oh, other people need it more, more than I do. Um, hey, you know, part of the mission of the church is to help people uh, in need. And so please don't hesitate to uh, contact us. You can send me an email, church an email, and just say, hey, you know, is there anything you can help out in this situation? And we'll do, we'll do the best that we can to help you out. Um, hey, our call to worship this morning is based on uh, the section of scripture that I'm going to speak about in a few minutes. And it comes from Exodus chapter 16 and and so uh let, let me read to you what um and and this was put together by some uh by another person but um here's our call to worship for today it says the ads online on tv and everywhere we look shout buy me you deserve me you're only worthy with me and some days we shout back enough and other days we let a theology and attitude of scarcity overtake us. And on those days we allow what we have to define us, control us, and restrict us. But God provides enough. God created each of us as enough. God creates a world of abundance. But our certainty of scarcity, our idolatry of the shiny, and our fears of others prevent us from gratitude, graciousness, and sharing. We live in an abundant world. Our Creator makes it so. And so during this time, Lord, we ask that you would move our hearts and lessen our fears. There is enough for all of us. Praise be to the God of abundant love. Praise to the God of enough. I pray that your worship experience this morning or whenever you're watching is, uh, um, is a good time of connection with God. Madeline, take it away. <laughs>
Sim. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to read a couple verses uh, from there in a minute. But uh, first of all, I want to tell you a story uh, that happened to George W. Bush just after his presidency. He was walking through an airport and he saw this man standing there. The man had a, a big white robe, uh, a big white robe on, you know, flowing white beard, flowing white hair, and he was standing there and he had a, a, a staff in one hand and a couple of stone tablets in the, underneath his arm. And so George Bush went up to him and, and he said, excuse me, sir, are you Moses? And the man was just kind of, just kind of standing there, just kind of looking around, you know, and, and uh, so President Bush again, he, you know, he kind of got in his line of sight a little bit and, you know, and they said, excuse me, sir, you know, are you Moses? And uh, again, the man was just kind of perusing the ceiling, you know, just trying to get this guy to go away. And finally, George Bush tugged on the guy's arm, uh, you know, on, on his uh, robe and he said, sir, sir, you look a lot like Moses. Are you Moses? And finally, the man standing there said, well, yes, I am. Where George Bush was kind of irritated at that. He just said, you know, why, why do you have to be so arrogant? Why do you be so rude at that? And so the man said, well, the last time I spoke to a Bush, I spent 40 years in the desert. <laughs> well, 
you know, not just that he spent 40 years in the desert, but he spent 40 years with people who were complaining all the time. And our scripture today is one of those incidents where the people were grumbling against Moses, which kind of leads us to an important point that God wants to get across to his people. So I'm going to start reading in Exodus chapter 16, just going to read 12 verses. I invite you to follow along. Here's what it says. If the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. Now that's not sin, sin like we think sin. That's just a, a Hebrew word transliteration for sin there. So don't get too uh, weird about it. And that is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. So a month and a half after they've been out of Egypt. And in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? that you should grumble against us. And Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread that you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord for he has heard your grumbling." And while Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Now, We've got those 12 verses there. There's one kind of theme that keeps popping up over and over. And of course, the word grumbling is mentioned seven times in those 12 verses. Obviously, it's a big issue here, but that's not what I want to talk about today. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But there's another thing that kind of pops up a few times in that passage of Scripture. And that is the, the kind of the phrase that you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, that you would know that it was the Lord who gives you meat and bread, that this idea that the Lord has provided for the people. Last week, we looked at God as healer. This week, it's kind of the Lord as provider. Now, the Hebrew people were at a really dangerous spot here because they have seen God's power in these big events like the, the God's power in the plagues, God's power in the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction. Then as the sea come back in over the Egyptians and the, and the defeat of their enemies. But that was a while ago, right? Now the people are hungry and they have an immediate need in their life. And it's almost like they're saying, God, what have you done for me lately? to the point where they're ready to go back to Egypt. And so God is ready to teach them another lesson, not just that he's the God of big events, but he is also the God of the ordinary every day. Now, I think it's important for us to take note of this because that's kind of what we do too. We tend to focus on God's activity in our lives in the big events, in, in the miracles. You know how God 
brought us through that hard surgery and how we and our family survived that terrible accident or when we lost our job and we didn't have regular income coming in and man, God provided for us in such a great way. Or even, even in our worship experience, we talk about that retreat that we went on when God was so real to us or that worship service that we were a part of and, and, and uh, that that uh, guest musician or that uh, favorite Christian band and they played all of our favorite tunes and man, we were just in that period of worship. We, we remember those bigger out of the ordinary events where it's obvious that God was there in this mountaintop experience. But what about when there are fewer mountaintop experiences or big events or miracles? What about if we find ourselves in the middle of a pandemic when we've been quarantined for months on end and we've lost our job or a reduction on our pay and nobody's hiring and whereas we go through this period, long period of time and we find ourselves stuck in a depression or our worship experiences have been reduced to sitting in front of a computer screen. You see, the danger is, is that we start losing sight of the fact that God is still in the everyday, ordinary things of life. When, when the big God of events become rare and the miracles stop and the awesome worship experiences don't happen as often as they used to, then we kind of get into this thinking, well, where's God? I, I haven't had that experience of God lately in my life. Where is he? Does he even care as much as he used to? How do we avoid that type of thinking as followers of Jesus? Because we want to be able to see God in the ordinary, everyday experiences of, of life. And so how do we go about keeping God close by? Well, I think one of the ways is that we do this. We remember that God isn't your uncle, he's your heavenly father. Now, here's what I mean by that. Now, many of us have that favorite aunt or favorite uncle that shows up to our house once in a while. We go visit them once in a while and they always are bringing us gifts or just, or just you know, they're just fun, they're loving, they, or they give us money or they take us places. And, and, you know, they, they will ask us, hey, what have you been up to? What are you doing lately? You know, and they, they, we just have a great, we enjoy having them around, but then they leave and then they go home. I mean, they're not the ones who raise us. They, they don't know all about us, but man, they certainly are pleasant to be around and they do bring blessings into our lives. But here's, the, here's what I'm getting, getting at. God is not called our heavenly uncle. He's called our heavenly father. Father, and he is the perfect, the perfect father. He is concerned with every area of our lives. He's not just in and out of our lives. He knows all about us. And so he's not surprised whenever, um, uh, you know, we tell him things, you know, it's not like God goes, whoa, when did that happen? I didn't know about that. How come you didn't tell me that? God is never surprised in our lives. Jesus was constantly telling the people stories about how much God cares for them. He would tell them stories like, you know, there's not a bird that doesn't fall to the ground that your heavenly father doesn't know about it. He, in fact, he knows so much about you. He, he numbered all the hairs on your head. Now, Jesus said that. That never really impressed me at all, but that's what Jesus said. The bottom line is, is that Jesus would tell stories that God knows all about you. First Peter chapter five, verse seven, it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And so what are the ways that we keep God close in mind? Is that, is that we remember that he isn't our uncle. He's our heavenly father and that we know we need to get in our mind that he cares for us more than we can imagine. And the second thing is that we do this. We mentally default to God's grace and kindness. 
Now, whenever we find ourselves in a bind, our first thought needs to always be that God is good all the time. That's a phrase a lot of times we'll say, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. But we need to mean it and understand it. You know, God, God is never mean. God is never out to punish us. And sometimes we think, oh, we did something stupid. And I know God is just let me have it. God is getting me back because of that. That is not God. God is full of grace and kindness to us. It is continual and abundant. That needs to be our default thinking in our mind. In verse 3, we read that the people complained because they didn't have any, any food. Okay, and so they're starting thinking, oh, you know, why, you know, we just wish we'd have been back in Egypt. It'd have been better for us to die back there. Now, I just got to ask you a question. If your children started responding in that sort of fashion, what would you say to them? I mean, if, if you were God, and this is what the Hebrew people say to you, what would, I mean, you would just want to wring their neck right there, right? And, you know, if I'd have been God in that situation, I'd have been like, all right, I was going to give you guys some food, but I'm going to make you wait another day if you're going to respond like that, right? I mean, if it had been my kid, it would have been instant grounding up to your room for a while. But that's not what God does here. In verse 4, look at God's response to the people. He says this, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. That's what God says. Now, what kind of parenting style is that? I mean, God is kind of an enabler here, here don't you think? No, that's not. God is a God of grace and kindness. In, in this situation right here, he doesn't get angry, right? He doesn't show his anger. In fact, he doesn't even address it, and he doesn't address their attitude or anything like that right here. I like whenever I, I order tickets to a football game or basketball game, sporting event, or a concert, I like when they send me the tickets. I don't care for the will call sort of thing. You know, I, it's always fun when you have the tickets in your hand and you can go back to them numerous times, you know, and just, ah, oh, can't wait. You know, I can't wait till I hear these tickets. It reminds you of that event that's coming up, right? We just can't wait for, for the game to happen. And if you're a follower of Jesus, there's something similar that's kind of going on for us. And, and Paul kind of talks about how we already have our tickets to heaven. We already have our seats in heaven. And I like what he says in Ephesians chapter 2. Look what Paul says. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. He doesn't say, oh, one day we are going to get to go to heaven and we'll be seated with God. He doesn't say that. He says it's in, like it's in the past. God has raised us up with Christ like it's already happened in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And what Paul's saying there is this, despite our crappy, sinful, messed up lives, God is giving, giving us reserved seating in heaven now. We already have our seats and our tickets right now. In other words, God's not waiting till judgment day. He's not waiting till he goes through our life and to see if we're worthy or anything like that. Nobody, none of us is worthy. And that's why his kindness, out of his grace and his kindness, he is seating us next to Jesus. That's just awesome. And then he wrote to Titus in chapter 3. He says, explaining the same sort of thing, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs through the hope of eternal life. Man, may the first thing that we think about in every situation that we go through, may we think about God's grace and his kindness and his mercy. And then number three is this, stop comparing, stop comparing. It's what the Hebrew people were doing. They were comparing their life now in, um, 
as they were going through the desert to what it was like in Egypt. Here's what they said. There, back in Egypt, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But yeah, you guys were slaves. What warped thinking that was going on in the minds of these people. Man, when we, when we compare, that just leads us to be ungrateful. When we compare to other people, just say, man, I wish I drove what, what they drove or lived in the house that they lived or the neighborhood that they lived. You know, I wish I went in places of vacation where they go. In other words, what we're kind of telling God is, God, come you're not blessing me. Why aren't you blessing me like you've blessed them? And then like the Israelites, we can compare our present with our past. I knew a guy one time who had a six-figure salary, a job with a six-figure salary, and they kind of adopted the lifestyle that went along with that. And then he lost his job. And even months later, his wife was really kind of hard on him because he wasn't able to find a job that paid as well. And you think about that sort of thinking, then you're kind of telling God, um, you're not blessing me today like you did back then. God, you're not around as much. You're just not involved in giving me the good things in my life now like you did back then. It's easy to say, have that same sort of attitude in what we're going through now as we go through this pandemic, right? Because we can think of pre-pandemic times and as much as we want to return back to, to the way it was, and I think that's, you know, that's a good goal for us. We certainly want to be rid of this pandemic. It's easy for us to think that, God, where are you today? God, you're not blessing me at all today. I mean, you did back then, but you've taken away so many things and you're just not blessing me now. And that leads, I think, to point number four. And that is to cultivate a lifestyle of gratitude. You think for a minute, what is the opposite of gratitude? Well, it's, it's grumbling, right? It's, and that's what the people were doing here. Their grumbling, their grumbling led them to believe that God was not around anymore. And, and because their needs hadn't been met. And so, I, I mean, in fact, if you go back and look at this passage, they never even spoke to God. They complained to Moses and, and Aaron. They didn't complain to God. It's like because of their situation, because of their grumbling, God was out of the picture. But when we cultivate a lifestyle of, of thankfulness and gratitude, that helps us to keep God in the picture. Elie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor and became a writer, despite all that he went through and witnessed of the Holocaust, he still insisted on living with gratitude. And in an interview that he gave a couple years ago, he said this, right after the war, I went around telling people, thank you just for living, for being human. And to this day, he says, the words that come most frequently from my lips are, thank you. And when a person doesn't have gratitude, something is missing in his or her humanity. A person can almost be defined by his or her attitude toward gratitude. In fact, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, give thanks in all all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's a lifestyle. Whenever we, you know, God's will for us is to be uh, grateful, man, that's a lifestyle. And that helps God to remain close in our lives. You know, whenever you get older, you kind of get one of these. You know, uh, this is a pill box, uh, kind of a, a daily reminder to take your medicine. And I can remember a couple of years ago when uh, I first got mine and I put it right there on the kitchen counter. And um, 
And my wife, Diana, who likes a clean kitchen counter, said, hey, why don't you keep this in the, uh, in the food pantry or, or keep it over on your desk? And I said, no, 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 no. I said, it's got to be right here on the counter because when I see it, then I will be reminded to take my medicine. And that leads us to point number five, and that's this. Get yourself a reminder to be grateful. Get yourself a reminder to be grateful. It says in verse 10, that while Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the, in the cloud. Now, what God had done is that he had brought back the cloud. If you recall from earlier, as the people were leaving Egypt and going through the desert, one of the ways that God led them was a pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And the cloud was a reminder to the people that God's presence was always with them, that God was always going to be with them, that God was always going to protect them and to provide for them. Now, there was a psychologist at Harvard who suggested that we can actually train our brains to become more grateful by setting aside just five minutes a day at the same time of day to write down three things that we're thankful for. And, and it doesn't have to be big things, it, but it does have to be concrete. It does have to be specific. Like um, I can be, and I could write down, I am thankful for the Mexican dinner that my wife made me. Or I'm thankful that I got to see that hawk in the backyard today. Or I'm thankful that I got to see a, a, a picture of my uh, granddaughter. You know, just they just have to be concrete and specific. And then, so he did this research where every day, same time of day, these people would write down three things that they're thankful for. And at the end of the month, the researchers found that those who practice this, this uh, uh, experiment, those who practice gratitude were happier. They had less anxiety. They were not as depressed. They had an overall better health, including those people who, as they were doing the research, they asked them to just stop after one week, just to stop after one week those people still exhibited better health sy sy symptoms, including after three months and after six months, even those people who had stopped after just one week. And so after all that, the researchers hypothesized that the simple practice of writing down three things that you are thankful for every day at the same time of day over the course of a week primed the participants' minds to search for the good in their lives. Man, if only the Hebrew people would have known that, huh? The fact of the matter is God is close to us. God is all around us despite the circumstances that we experience. That God is here even in the ordinary and the everyday. We just need reminders and habits in our life to prime our minds to always recall God's blessing. What habits will you implement in your life to remind yourself that God is always a part of your ordinary, everyday life? That's your homework for the week. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much that you are a God who um, um, you don't show up dependent on how we, how we act. You are always with us. In fact, Scripture says that you never leave us nor forsake us. Not only that, you are a God who wants the best for us. You are a God who's takes an interest in our lives, who, are, who is involved in every activity of our lives. And so, Lord, we kind of begin here today 
We ask for forgiveness for those times when we have grumbled over your lack of involvement or that you didn't reveal yourself like we thought that you should have. God, forgive us for those times when we've displayed an ingratitude in our, in our life and in our, in our actions, acting like you're not close by. And so, Father, to change this, may we ask for your help, that you would help us to install, to, to develop some new habits in our life that will always remind us of your presence and that will help to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for, for listening today, and I pray that that God blesses you and that you recognize it. Have a good day.